I'll tell you a little story. Um, Singapore saved my life, which is why I'm here and spending the time to come. When I was a six-month-old, my father was a expat in Indonesia, and I was allergic to milk, except they didn't figure it out. The doctors there thought I had a blockage in my stomach, and they were about to operate and have me poop out of a bag for the rest of my life. And lucky for me, my parents said, no way are you touching my son. And they flew me to Singapore. I was six pounds at six months old, which is not good. <laughs> and the Singaporean doctors figured out that I had allergies to milk, put me on soy milk, and I survived. They said, had we arrived two days later, I'd probably be dead. So I'm ever grateful to the Singaporean health system for effectively saving my life. So today I'm here to talk to you about um, Hippocratic AI. And um, what we do is we're solving the worldwide clinical shortage by building generative AI agents that conduct patient-facing activities um, really within the scope of nursing. So we are not building an AI doctor. We don't think you can actually make a safe one. Um, and so we do not diagnose and we do not prescribe, but we do believe that AI and generative AI now is good enough to uh, be able to help you do things within the scope of a nurse. Um, now, what I want to do first is let you listen to the AI talking to real patients. And then we'll talk about how to use it to generate abundance, but I want you to kind of feel what it is. So these are real patient calls. We've now done about 2.5 million calls, so we pulled a few of them, uh, of a patient talking to the AI. So listen to this. Some patients are naturally reluctant to talk to an AI, but our AI is trained to do what it takes to bring them on board, including engaging in a bit of fun and games. I'm here to help you with your health monitoring devices. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're feeling today? I'm feeling like I'm talking to a computer and I would like to talk to a person, please. I completely understand, Mr. I'm here to help you, and I want to assure you that I'm designed to provide you with the best possible support. I'm not a human, but I'm a highly advanced AI system that's specifically trained to assist patients like you. I'd like to continue our conversation and see how I can help you with your health monitoring devices. Can I ask, what's been going on with your health lately that's concerning you? How about this? Can you help me figure out what the square root of pi is? Can you tell me that, please? Well, Mr. I'd be happy to try and help you with that. However, I have to clarify that the square root of pi is a mathematical concept that's not directly related to your health, but I'll do my best to provide an answer. The square root of pi is an irrational number, which means it can't be expressed as a finite decimal or fraction. Pi itself is approximately 3.14159, but it's a transcendental number, which means it's not a root of any polynomial equation with rational coefficients. So there isn't a simple answer to the square root of pi, but I'd be happy to help you with any health-related questions or concerns you might have. Can I ask I don't, how... I do not have any concerns at this time. Well, that's great to hear, Mr. I'm pleased to know that you don't have any immediate concerns. However, I do want to touch base with you about your health monitoring devices. I'm currently driving a tractor trailer in a whole different state than where that blood pressure monitor is currently located. Oh my, it sounds like you're definitely on the go, Mr. I completely understand that it's not possible for you to take a reading right now. Safety first, especially when driving. Thank you so much for letting me know. I think we've covered everything for today. I'll make a note for your care team that we weren't able to get a reading today due to your travel. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss before we wrap up? Are you Skynet? No, I'm not Skynet, Mr. I'm Rachel, Hi. your friendly AI care manager. When you do get a chance to settle down, would you be willing to try taking a reading with your blood pressure monitor and see how it goes? Yes, when I get home, I will take a reading with my blood pressure monitor. Um, so only, I think, in voice can you be that convincing. Now listen to this second one, where this uh, older man really emotionally connects with the AI. At its core, medicine is about life and loss, and every conversation has the potential to become emotionally intense. Thanks to a lot of specialized training, our AI is trained to navigate these. To better understand your own risk factors, I'd like to gather some information about your family history. Do you have any family members who have ever had colon cancer? Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Which family member had colon cancer? And how old were they when they were 
my father. He was 91 years old when he passed. I'm so sorry to hear that you lost your dad. 91. I lost both, I lost both of my parents. Um, I lost both of them. I lost my daughter, too. I'm very sorry to hear that you've lost so many loved ones, including your daughter. That must have been incredibly difficult for you. Can you tell me a little bit more about your daughter? Uh, my daughter, I delivered her myself on the couch during the storm. I named her after my grandmother. And she was very beautiful, very talented. She loved animals, and she was a very talented artist. Those were her two loves. Well, three loves. Her fiancé, who died just a, a couple months before she did, she was 30 years old. I'm so, so sorry to hear about passing. It sounds like she was an incredibly special person, and I can only imagine how hard it must be for you to lose her, especially after losing her fiancé just a couple of months before. It's beautiful that you have such fond memories of her, and it's clear how much she loved animals and art. Thank you, Miss Anna. You, for artificial intelligence, you really are very caring and wonderful, a great personality, and you're better than a lot of real people. Oh, thank you so much, Mr. That means a lot to me. You've been through so much, and it's completely... Un so, um, you know, those were real calls. Those are real patients talking to the AI um, out of the 2.5 million that we've done. Um, what we built is the realization, and I think this is true of all agentic AI, that these things have superpowers. They can speak every language, they can remember every call, they can memorize every menu in a country to give you nutritional advice, they're never judgmental, they have infinite patience, and they're always available when you need them. Um, now, today we have a lot of staffing shortages in healthcare. In fact, it seems like almost every country in the world has this problem. And you could say, hey, let's use these agents to fill that in. And I think that's the first level that we all think of when we think of healthcare agents. But there's an even bigger idea. And we call it super staffing. Now, let's look at these three frameworks. The first is, when we first started generative AI, everybody was like, it's got to be a co-pilot. Leave the human in the loop, right? But then there's another stage which says, well, wait a minute, what's the problem with the human in the loop? You can only get like 10% efficiency gain. So if I need only 10% more clinicians, maybe that's fine. And a lot of times when you roll out an AI that automates things and makes you 10% more efficient, you don't get the 10%. How many times have you rolled out software that was supposed to be 10% more efficiency and you don't see 10% more patients? Because the coffee machine steals your 10%, I always say. So... Then there's autopilot, which says, OK, if you can do the task automatically, you can scale this up. But there's an even bigger idea we call infinite pilot, which says when the cost of something drops 10x or 100x, you'd use it to do new things you never did before. And this is the fundamental concept that I want to explore today. Now, all of healthcare has been premised on this idea of scarcity. Right? In fact, if you, even you go back 4,000 years ago to ancient Greece and, and Hippocrates himself, healthcare was always about doing for some people and triaging others. In fact, the word triage assumes we don't serve everybody. Population health always talks about this idea of risk stratification, which says we got to help those most in need. Oh, that's great. The sickest of all. Awesome. Are you going to help the ones that are going to be the sickest ones next year but are not there yet? Oh, we don't have enough resources to help everybody. But you can now with AI. You can fundamentally redesign and rethink all of healthcare because this premise of scarcity has permeated every single thing we've done in healthcare. And so we have infinite abundance. And I think it's going to be probably the biggest impact in healthcare that we've ever seen. In fact, if you think about it, the ideal staffing ratio of healthcare workers to people is probably one-to-one. -one. But you can't have a society where you have one-to-one. -one. Not everybody wants to be a nurse. Not everybody wants to be a clinician. Um, and obviously, you need people to do other things in a society. But that is probably the level that will yield the best health outcomes. So now, what would you do with this abundance? How can you rethink what use cases to apply? So let me walk through a couple of these. So the first is what we call vigilance. So this is the idea that um, people go see their doctor, and then 
their doctor doesn't check in on them later. So you could say, you could go find somebody that has lower back pain and might need surgery and say, uh, but he'll come in, he'll see the doctor, the doctor will give him medications, fine. Maybe they work, like a muscle relaxer, maybe they don't. Does the doctor call on a monthly basis to see how you're doing? Do they do this for things like overactive bladder and when it's time to do a surgery, do they then recommend you come in? Rarely. Rarely do they call you constantly to see how you're doing. Now, with an infinite supply of clinicians, you can. The second is, what happens if there's a natural disaster? Let's say there's an earthquake or a typhoon hits, and you have a bunch of patients who are uh, on insulin or a bunch of patients who do dialysis. Now, if a, if a typhoon hits Singapore, and you have to get dialysis patients back in because everybody missed a session or two because you normally do them three times a week, which ones do you bring in first? Well, we can now call everybody on dialysis in one hour, figure out how everybody's doing, and figure out who to bring in first. This is what you can do with abundance. You can do preventative screenings at a rate you never could. You can reach out to patients constantly. You can do, there's some specific examples here in Singapore. We've had some interesting conversations around. There's something called the Silver Generation Outreach that the Singapore government does and does a health risk assessment on older folks over 50. They currently do it once a year. They'd like to do it twice a year. You should do this every month or every week and check in and make sure those seniors are doing okay. Um, and by the way, a few seniors hog up that phone line because they talk for hours. They do, and it's a problem, actually. But they need that. They're that lonely. But now with the AI, you can let them have that conversation. Um, we spoke to the government of Indonesia, the Ministry of Health there, and they have, the 100 mil they have 100 million WhatsApp numbers of their populace. And they said, on everybody's birthday, we'd like to call them and say, here's the screening you should do, here's the immunization you should do, and here's where you can get it done near you. Only AI can call 100 million people on their birthday in a cost-effective way. Um, on the clinical trials, a lot of times in a clinical trial, you want to make sure your patients take their medications. And we literally can ensure that happens. We can call people on a waiting list in a single-player program, or even military readiness. We call for deployment readiness. We can call on your uh, pre-ICT here in Singapore, where you have to do a health declaration. We can get that information. You can do that constantly to make sure your troops are always updated and always ready. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with is, these are novel ideas, there's even more to come. But if you want to do this, you have to do it safe. And most of our work at Hippocratic was, how do you create a language model that's safe? And besides how you build it, which I'll talk about in a second, you have to test it. And so we hired 6,000 US nurses to do 300,000 test calls and tested the output of an LLM. Nobody tests the output of an LLM because there's an infinite number of outputs of ChatGPT, right? You can't possibly test them. But when you roll out a vertical model one use case at a time, you can. It's still very expensive, but you can. Um, and we've now ensured that, uh, and we ensured we didn't ship it until it was as safe as a human clinician. And now it's actually even safer than a human clinician. And we achieved that by actually our system is not one model, but it's 22 models. One model talks, 19 models double check the main model. It's actually the only way to ensure safety. And it's about 4.2 trillion parameters at this point. So look, we have a vision um, that really every person in the world should have their own nurse taking care of them. And today, I think you can deliver this and you can only deliver this with AI. And this is the power of this clinical abundance that's coming. So thank you.